So hello and welcome to another episode of Geographics. I am your co-host, Carl Smallwood. It's not Eric today, it's me, Carl with a K, and a Smallwood with a small and then a wood. And today we're talking about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the grim future riding along the waves. And something I like to point out in Geographics, Biographics, and Top 10s videos is that these videos are by no means a solitary effort on my part. If you're watching this channel, you'll know that we've got another host, Eric. Hi, Eric. He also does some of the editing for these videos. But yeah, before I even get my eyes on the script, at least half a dozen other people have put their hands and eyes upon it. The first, of course, being the author, who today is Dustin Kosky. So you can find them at their social media links provided below. But let's get to it. When it first became an international news item, this behemoth was a vision of a very grim and dark future, as many nations along the Pacific Ocean approached levels of industrialization and consumption comparable to the United States, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, or GPGP, served as a perfect illustration of just how unsustainable this would be. Its other common name, the Pacific Trash Vortex, feels somehow more appropriate. It represents a future where mankind sucks itself down into oblivion under a massive pile of garbage. And I'm going to use garbage here because that's what it says in the script and it's what it's known as colloquially, but I may sometimes use the word rubbish because I'm British and that's just what we'd say when we saw a big pile of trash. We don't say the word trash either, we just say rubbish. So I may use some British colloquialisms here and there, but I'll try my best not to because I know that upsets some Americans. So if humanity is to deal with this, we should quantify the impact it has on the environment. How large is this patch? What's the rate of size change? Just how dangerous to the Pacific Ocean's wildlife is this large mass of trash? And what's being done about it, if anything's being done at all? How effective are those measures? And most of all, how did all this stuff happen and are my car keys in there? Like, what is in there? It's like, it's just, it's just a big mass, right? Well, snap on your goggles, get on your wetsuit, life vest and some very, very sturdy gloves. You know, metaphorically speaking, because we're gonna set sail to find the answer to those questions. <laughs> Like so many momentous findings in science, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch wasn't so much found as stumbled upon. In August 1997, San Diego University alum Charles Moore was sailing the Trans-Pacific Yacht Race from Los Angeles to Hawaii, claiming he did so to test repairs to his research vessel, the Alguita, after storms near American Samoa had ruined the mast. His vessel was put to a greater test than he expected when hurricane-force winds brought on by El Nino season blew him off course. He found himself in the North Pacific subtropical gear, which is both a convergence point for both the major North Pacific channels and one of the most remote locations on Earth. There, more known noticed like a lot of rubbish, like a staggeringly large amount of rubbish. And he began playing a grim game with himself where every few moments he would glance over the gunwale to see if the surrounding water was clear of any and all rubbish. As he reported upon his return, he never did so for the duration of his entire week-long journey through the vortex. Moore was not at all content to rest on his laurels despite having reported the discovery that made his reputation in oceanographic circles around the world. By the very next year, he joined expeditions back to the patch and as late as 2023, he was still taking in expeditions, researching and cleaning up the world's largest accidental garbage dump. The fact that the initial discovery of the garbage patch was an accident is an indication that even right in the middle of it, the garbage patch is not the immediately obvious behemoth that you might imagine in your mind. It's not like a floating junkyard that spans hundreds of thousands of miles. Certainly walking or standing upon it is completely out of the question. Such a site would have been caught by satellites, if not the numerous fishing vessels long before more chanced upon it. However, there is a good possibility that much of the surface of the ocean's floor beneath is covered in immense trash piles we will likely never see. As reported by the National Geographic, about 70% of the ocean trash ends up on the floor. And I'm reminded of the Geographics video we did about the Marianas Trench, where they were talking about how they sent cameras down there to see what the hell was going on and noticed something that looked almost man-made. And when they managed to clear up the image on the cameras after the fact, it was a piece of frozen merchandise. As in, you know, Frozen, the, the Disney movie. In the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the single like most inhospitable and inaccessible place on planet Earth. And there's Disney stuff down there. 
The reach of the mouse is ridiculous, but that's, you know, a story for another day and one that we've already told and you can find a link to that below. But part of the issue is that a considerable quantity of the plastic bobbing on the surface has already been extremely broken down between the corrosion of salt water, the churn of the ocean waves and the often sustained and refracted glare of the sun. It doesn't take long for the plastic trash to break down into a consistency much like silt. Several sources have described the result as a semi-transparent plastic soup, which sounds disgusting and hence why it's not really visible on satellites just it just looks like a big patch of water it's not until you physically get close enough to see it that you realize oh oh yeah this dissolved status has allowed the patch to span from 1200 miles west of the Baja California coast to just southeast of Japan despite the name the flow of currents has resulted in the supposed patch actually consisting of two separate distinct vortexes there's one near North America known as the North Pacific subtropical high and one for Asia known as the Western garbage patch with a thin arc between the two along the northern currents called the subtropical convergence zone these are all words I don't understand but the author seemingly does the result vaguely looks like a bar Barbell of the type rarely seen floating, combining the size of the three sections, the patch is about 620,000 square miles, roughly the same size as Mongolia. The total weight of the debris, as published by the Ocean Cleanup Project, is estimated to be around 100,000 tons. So, to put this into perspective, the Empire State Building weighs about 360,000 tons. Alternately, the weight of the trash is equal to about 500 jumbo jets, at least according to calculations by the Smithsonian. This comes to roughly 330 pounds of plastic bobbing on the surface per square mile, which admittedly doesn't sound like all that much for an area of that size. But now just think about, you know, how much a handful of confetti weighs. Yeah. And then, the, you know, the scale of the problem starts to become apparent. It's, it's not the weight. It's the fact that plastic just doesn't break down, which brings us to our next section. Surveying 600,000 square miles of drifting trash is a tall order and makes a precise prognosis of what sort of trash comprises the garbage patch quite difficult. For example, for years it was generally accepted that about 20% or one-fifth of garbage was fishing nets either fully discarded or tatters of remnants that had been left behind. A 2018 study, however, completely upended this when it found that as much as 46%, close to half of the samples came from net fishing. The study was further substantiated by a report from Greenpeace stating that over 600 140,000 tons of industrial fishing equipment gets abandoned in the oceans each and every year. To get an idea of just how massive this waste can be, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch nets were once found to have washed up on a two mile long stretch on the shore of Henderson Island, 2,700 miles west of Peru. The refuse weighed an estimated 18 tons and 60% of it came from fishing nets, lines, etc. Henderson Island is part of the world's third largest marine wildlife sanctuary, which just goes to show how industrial pollution can can effortlessly bypass environmental regulations and concerns. Microplastics, which are generally categorized as any piece of plastic less than 1.9 inches long, at first glance give the impression they're a relatively insubstantial part of the trash vortex, comprising approximately 8% of the mass. In terms of numbers of parts, though, they comprise an overwhelming share. There are an estimated 1.9 trillion individual pieces of garbage swirling through these vortexes, and microplastics are roughly 94% of them. As we'll see later, Later, that's more than enough microplastics to present one of the largest problems in the oceans. And yeah, microplastics just continue kicking humanity's ass. Did anyone see, for example, that study released, I think, last year when it was publicised, or that's when at least I saw it being publicised, is they found microplastics in the lungs of newborn babies that have yet to draw their first breath. Yay! Moving away from microplastics to macroplastics and indeed megaplastics. For the curious, macroplastics are defined by oceanographers as pieces of plastic debris more than 1.9 inches long, and megaplastics are anything larger than two feet. These should not be discounted as a threat to the ocean and, you know, everything that lives there, including us. For example, ghost nets, which are described as lost commercial fishing nets, are estimated to kill some 650,000 marine animals per year through drowning, crushing, and other horrible things we won't get too into. Since then, they're largely made of plastic, the many scraps of them floating around the seas are more than able to continue killing animals for many, many years after they've been left adrift. For example, according to a report by the Columbia Climate School in 2011, the plastic of a fishing net is sufficiently durable, even in the corrosive seawater, that it can continue inflicting damage upon marine wildlife for as long as 600 years. 
Yeah, hell world, here we come. Especially deadly are so-called gill nets, which often stretch more than a mile long. They've been known to stretch more than 12 miles in some cases. For the sheer indiscriminate damage they inflict, gill nets have been banned by the European Union and the United Nations, and while there's some uncertainty over how much of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch's mass comes from this particular pollutant, ghost nets' deadliness is not disputed. They kill nearly a million animals per year, and of course they're just going to get absorbed into the giant vortex of floating trash. That's killing everything it comes into contact with. Why wouldn't it? Yay. Giant meteor 2024, end it all. If this is sounding like a haughty scolding of humanity for daring to pollute, it's worth noting that the trash vortex is, to a significant degree, not the fault of human intent or negligence, although it still kind of is a little bit. Indeed, a lot of the junk got there in ways humanity very much did not want or could not have stopped. For example, an estimated 20% of it was washed out to sea by the way of the 2011 Tohoku tsunami, largely remembered for the accompanying Fukushima disaster. Considering that the National Tsunami Warning Center reports there's an average of two annual major tsunamis like that one each year, it's annoyingly likely that major efforts to clean up the trash vortex will, at some point, be undone by nature. If anyone has felt a passing curiosity why there's a three-part trash vortex in the Pacific Ocean and none in the other oceans, it's because there actually totally are other major garbage patches out there. The others are just less publicised, so no one really talks about them. There's one in the Indian Ocean, and technically two in the Atlantic, in the same sense that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is defined as two parts as well. There's a North Atlantic Garbage Patch, which by spanning from 20 degrees north to 38 north latitude is roughly as wide as the distance between Virginia and Cuba, or nine 190 miles. The South Pacific Garbage Patch, which is 350,000 square miles, roughly the same area as Nigeria, is the smallest of the five. Yay! The Indian Ocean Patch is projected to span some 617,000 square miles and is largely located in the Bay of Bengal to the east of the Indian Peninsula. These other garbage patches have been much less studied than those of the Pacific, even though the North Atlantic one was first brought to public attention in a 1972 article in the journal Science. One thing that studies have consistently reported though is that those in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans are significantly less dense than those of the Pacific. For example, there is a 2011 study published by Columbia University that found that there were 20 to 25,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometre in the Atlantic patches, and a relatively modest 10,000 per square kilometre in the Indian Ocean patch. By contrast, the Pacific Ocean averaged 25 to 40,000. In the case of the Indian Ocean, this lower density is due to how the Indonesian through-flow currents transport much of their macroplastic waste to the Pacific Ocean, so that much of it ends up in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch instead. Just, you know, that time-honoured tradition of just sending the rubbish somewhere else for those guys to worry about. Also, monsoon winds are noted to push other masses of plastic debris to Africa around the Cape of Good Hope, and from there into the South Atlantic Garbage Patch. For once, India, both publicly and secretly, a long-time gigantic importer of trash, made its garbage someone else's problem. And indeed, it's probably all of our problems now. It's just basically just it's going around a big circle, a vortex, if you will. Whatever the relative density is, all the garbage patches are leaving behind a great number of corpses in their wake. For example, according to a 2018 report from the Pew Charitable Trust, the plastic waste in them is so deadly that a million seabirds per year are killed through the ruinous effects eating it has on their digestive systems. Add to that an estimated 100,000 mammals that suffer similar fates, in addition to the many large cold-blooded creatures. For instance, a study of sea turtles around the Pacific Trash Vortex found that 74% of their diet was indigestible plastic even dolphins, which are able to detect the material components of things ahead of them through sonar and thus are unlikely to directly fill their stomachs with unnourishing plastic, are still at risk, as their abilities are not so advanced that they can detect that their prey hasn't had a stomach full of plastic. So even dolphins, well, you know, widely considered the smartest thing in the ocean, still falls for eating plastic because the things it eats are dumb enough to eat the plastic, so they eat it by proxy, and it's like everything sucks. And here's the thing, animals do not even need to eat the plastic to be endangered by its effects, nor even be large enough to eat any of it at all. Plankton populations have been devastated by the aforementioned plastic soup, cutting off the much-needed solar rays to phytoplankton or plant plankton. It has been so destructive that when Charles Moore's team analysed the area in 1990, 
1998 and then returned to monitor them again in 2008, they found that the ratio of plastic to plankton in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch areas had increased more than seven times over in the plastic's favour, 6 to 1 in 1998 to 46 to 1 in 2008. And for anyone out there thinking, well, who, who gives a shit? it's plankton? Um, plankton serves as pretty much the foundation of like you know all life in the ocean as well as providing about half of the oxygen to the earth's atmosphere so yeah it's it's kind of a concern for everybody who needs to breathe oxygen yeah moving on to coral reefs these are at least as threatened if not more so by the risk of plastic than from the disease vector for example in 2018 science magazine posted a study of 159 areas that found that reefs that had a default four percent risk of catching common diseases among reefs principally black band disease and skeletal band eroding when significant amounts of plastic were introduced the rate of infection went up to 89 percent and it's not as if the coral reefs are doing all that well as we discussed in our video on the great barrier reef which you can find here i, I don't know where you click on videos I, i'm gonna be gonna be honest i don't click on many youtube videos i'm on youtube i don't watch many youtube videos but there's something you can click to go watch that video i'm sure the editors have assured me that's a thing you can do so the basic components of plastic are hazardous even excluding the disease and starvation factors there are many forms of plastic which contain substances like delightfully called persistent bioaccumulative toxins which just sounds terrible, right? That's like the last thing you want in the source of all oxygen for the Earth, almost. An example is, oh, this is a word. Oh, decambrohomide phenylether. I'll give it another go. Decambrohomide phenylether. It's, 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 oh, you know what? It's this word. This long ass word here. Okay, so this is a carcinogenic neurotoxin and indicated to be particularly hazardous when it comes to liver and thyroid cancer. Of samples tested from the Pacific Ocean, a staggering 84% of the plastic mass was found to possess that. That. And as if it wasn't bad enough that the plastic contains it, as it slowly breaks down, this is released into the water. These poisons and toxins then accumulate in quite worrying quantities among marine life around the trash vortex, especially for seafood customers. For Americans, this is a significant problem, as a 2018 paper by the Current Environment Health reports that around 90% of all such food is imported from areas with significant plastic leakage problems. These health and wildlife risks are growing at an alarming rate. Even now, every year, an estimated 2.4 million tons of these substances are dumped into the oceans. It's forecasted that by 2050, the amount of plastic in the oceans will outweigh all of the fish in them. I don't know how many more of these I've got in me, folks. And bring it back to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch itself, since being first found by Charles Moore, it has more than quadrupled in size. That report was back in 2018, by the way, so right now we have about five extra years of dumping stuff to add to that figure. <sighs> So how daunting of a task is it to clean up 500 jumbo jets worth of trash spread over a surface the size of Mongolia, more than a thousand miles from shore? And also the trash is moving and constantly being replenished by billions of people. And let's just put it this way, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration published an estimate that if 67 ships were devoted to this task and solely this task for an entire year and worked around the clock, they would collect 1% of the total of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And keep in mind, there are other big garbage patches and vortexes around the world that nobody talks about that are also growing in size and deadliness. To be fair, this hasn't stopped people from trying, because we all know that God loves a trier, often going to great lengths to quantify the sheer scale of the crises. The largest scale effort to quantify the cleanup task was a mission of 30 vessels using 652 nets in 2015 by the organization Ocean Cleanup, which was founded in 2012. This was a venture so elaborate it was dubbed a mega expedition. And these were not minor sailboats either with people just picking stuff up out of the ocean as they went by. The mothership, the Ocean Star, was 171 feet long. After three months of survey, they collected 1.2 million pieces of plastic, which provided quite useful data. Data, but only represented 0.000067% of the whole 
thing. And among the hundreds of tons of trash they cleaned up were quite a few novel things that like the Ocean Cleanup Project themselves went through, at least in part, in a video titled, quite aptly, The Trash Tour. And some of the things they found included enough astroturf and golf balls to basically make an 18-hole course, a veritable army of tiny little plastic soldiers, an entire fridge, wheels from helicopters that had fallen off and just gone overboard, snow shovels, boogie boards, surfboards, like fishing nets, like anything you can imagine, like anything you'd throw away would, might have ended up in that pack. It's the scale is staggering and the stuff they found is redonkulous. But to get an even more conclusive and quite literal picture of the situation, a 2016 expedition was launched which used a C-130 Hercules aircraft with three different sonar and camera systems. 7,000 high altitude photographs were combined for the final survey result and a large number of the objects photographed would be cryptically labelled unknown. The most significant finding of this expedition though was that fishing nets actually comprised a staggering 75% of the mass of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and it made the argument that the best way to combat this form of ocean pollution would be to stop using plastic fishing nets uncomfortably clear. For all of its good intentions, Ocean Cleanup came under harsh criticism for its practical effectiveness in terms of cleaning up the trash it worked so hard to study. In a 2023 Washington Post article, it was pointed out that their methods of trash trawling endangered the very animals that it intended to save in essentially the same way commercial fishing did. After all, it's very difficult for the people to be delicate and precise in what they fish out of the ocean when they're using nets more than a mile long, which will haul in as much as 18 tons in a single catch. And as we detailed earlier, that's the same thing that's so damaging to the ocean when they do it to catch fish. Furthermore, the amount of trash they collected came to a modest 3,300 tonnes. At this rate, they would need more than a century, even if the rest of humanity very considerably stopped polluting the oceans right this very second. So, so it's probably more of a, an awareness raising measure than anything. Moving on, a particularly flamboyant gesture came from Ben Lecomte, who in 2019 performed a promotional stunt when he would swim through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. He dubbed the effort the Vortex Swim, and it took him three 338 miles over the course of 80 days. Considering that Ben had previously swum the Atlantic Ocean east to west, it might seem like a comparatively modest task. Then you have to consider that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is much more shark infested than the average stretch of open ocean. There was a lot of dead and dying things in there that sharks like to eat, and then it becomes a wonder that he swam through much of it at all. Lecomte claimed that he had a close encounter with a shark while trying to shake a fish free from a floating bit of ghost net. Other wildlife got much too close to Lecomte for his comfort, such as crabs that climbed into his diving suit without attracting his attention until he climbed back on board. Yeah, Lecomte was not only performing a stunt, as he was accompanied by researchers including a University of North Carolina professor, Rebecca Helm. In addition to having swum through a record-setting amount of garbage, Lecomte and his team recovered many thousands of additional samples. They also collected a toilet seat that had been floating among the garbage, hopefully without Lecomte needing to swim his head through it first. Despite the sheer scale of the task, cleaning all that water may not be merely, if you will pardon the expression, a pipe dream. Technological innovations offer some quite promising prospects. Robots in particular have been developed which could work wonders in collecting plastics both of the micro and macro variety. One of the more interesting is dubbed Waste Shark, a product from the Ran Marine Company. It was tested in the United Kingdom's notoriously poo polluted rivers in 2023 and has had battery power for about 10 hours of operation. Of one battery charge, it has been demonstrated to collect as many as 21,000 bottles worth of plastics. So we could very well see the ocean one day cleaned up by an army of robotic sharks. Even more promising than the waste shark, though not as coolly named, is the Clearbot Neo, which inventor Sidan Gupta claimed he was inspired to create in 2019 after a trip to the polluted waters of Bali. So first of all, this robot is capable of collecting over 2,000 pounds of plastic per day. Additionally, it's capable of filtering out oil from the water. More significantly though, it's the cheapest option to operate currently available on the market, costing only around $1,000 per robot as of 2023. But an advantage of both it and the waste shark is that they have the counterintuitive advantage of being relatively slow moving aquatic automatons, which means that they pose less of a danger to the wildlife than the ocean cleanups nets. So even though they move slowly, they move carefully. And that's really what's required here. A steady, careful hand, not just a sweeping everything off the table, regardless of what may be contained therein. A key issue though, is that as of March, 2023, the fleet deploying them is 
owned and operated by only two people. So the process by which it could be implemented as a solution for the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is still very much in its infancy. So at the end of the day, by far the most practical way to deal with all the ocean garbage patches is clearly more on the supply side than the cleanup process. There have been ambitious proposals made to get nations to simply stop dumping plastic in the oceans. In 2022, the United Nations Environmental Assembly passed Resolution 514 to phase out plastic pollution in its entirety. Sample goals have included Norway and Rwanda intended to completely phase out ocean dumping of petrochemicals by 2040. Just a thing that I didn't know companies could do, but again, awesome. So as they conceded at the time, it would be an immense ask for worldwide fishing industries to abandon their use of plastic nets, let alone to convince all sanitation industries around the world to stop their industrial littering. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is one of the largest and remotest threats to world wildlife, both in terms of size and numbers of animals and people affected directly and indirectly. The prospect of stopping its toxic spread has proven even more daunting than it appeared back during its discovery in 1997. Yet, even as it drains the ocean's humanity relies on for food of life, it gives an impression of general harmlessness because of how thin its toxins seem to be spread. It is for all intents and purposes the plastic filled stomach for the Pacific ecosystem. It remains to be seen if humanity will be able to purge it properly. And I hope everyone at home found this video to be, I'm not going to say like I normally do, educational, informative and entertaining, absolutely horrifying. I knew about this thing, as I, I imagine many people do, through pop culture osmosis. I, I was aware there was a big, massive pile of plastic in the ocean, and no one was really doing anything about it. So when I saw this script in the archives, I thought, well, that's going to be a gut punch to get through initially. But I bet, I bet it ends on a really hopeful note that there's a bunch of stuff happening that I wasn't aware of to address this problem. And no, that's not the case. So if you've also felt just the, the emotional gut punch from this content like I have, you can go thank the author, Dustin Kosky, by following them on social media, or like as they've helpfully mentioned in the script here, checking out their book, Robin Hood vs. King Arthur, which they describe as a fantasy comedy about exactly what it sounds like. I've been your co-host, Carl Smallwood, and as I always like to say, go out there and have the day that you deserve. No. I've got a tin of tuna for my lunch. I'm going to feel so bad eating it. Oh yeah, like, comment, subscribe.